sanctuary in South Australia is protecting one of the largest remaining stands of ancient Meli. Endangered animals that once thrived here are being returned to an ecosystem as it has been for thousands of years. Key to the success here at Yukamara Sanctuary is a 14 kilometre feral proof fence. Do a voltage check and figure out which, of the, um, which part of the fence has actually got a problem. Australia has the worst record in the world for mammal extinction, mainly due to introduced animals and habitat destruction. There are a few little woolies just there. Native animals at Yukamara are thriving. They have old growth forest and protection from predators like foxes, cats and dogs. I reckon there's a spark. Staff are on 24 hour call to ensure the fence is not compromised. This wire is actually coming, so kangaroos probably, I don't know, tried to leave the sanctuary. It's gone through, the wires have got twisted around each other and this little black plastic space has managed to get in the way and um, it's managed to cause the problems and the wires have joined together but that should have fixed our problem. These uh, top sender wires here, um, they pretty much let kangaroos and emus come through the fence. Smaller things like um, foxes and cats and dogs um, have a lot of trouble because they generally they come up and inspect it first and the outside outrigger wires that we have here have 10,000 volts going through them uh, so that generally discourages them to come near the fence again. Certainly uh, anything introduced has real problems getting through this fence. Nocturnal animals are seeking shelter as the harsh summer sun rises over the melee. By 9 o'clock it's 30 degrees in the shade. A chorus of bird songs echoes through the forest. Birds, insects and reptiles emerge into one of the hottest and driest environments on earth. Termites and ants become active. Their number one predator will soon be on the hunt. This property was originally purchased for its suitability to save endangered native animals like the numbat. It is one of the few Australian marsupials that feed during the day, its diet being exclusively termites that travel between trees and galleries under the ground. By 1982, Australia's population of numbats had dwindled to less than 300. It was named the world's most endangered mammal. It had been reduced from its original range across the southern half of Australia to a few forests in the west. This was caused mainly by habitat destruction and predation by foxes. This numbat will make a hundred of these diggings in a day, its long sticky tongue catching over 15,000 termites. Termites exposed by the numbat are also prey for an army of black ants. Ants usually cut termites away in pieces, but these termites appear to lock jaws in an effort to prevent being decapitated. The echidna eats termites and ants. It is far better equipped to defend itself against predators than the numbat. The echidna has a lifespan of around 50 years, one of the longest living mammals in the world.
The Numbat's first line of defence is its camouflage and excellent eyesight. A bird of prey can spot movement from high above. The Numbat uses short bursts of motion to avoid being seen. As a last resort, an old log is crucial for a bolt hole. Termites provide the numbat with its diet and home. They eat their way through the core of a mallee tree and after 400 years the hollow is large enough for a numbat to live in. Baby numbats are reared by their mother in a burrow under the ground. These babies are two months old and while mum is away feeding for the day, they are exploring their new world. It is an opportunity to try those hind legs for the first time. The babies are in danger as they venture away from the family nest. At ground level they are particularly vulnerable to goannas and snakes. This is Madge. She is a fully grown numbat and she is being fitted with a radio tracking collar. By tracking numbats like Madge, crucial information can be gathered about home range size and population density. Madge covers about 30 acres in a day in her search for termites. All the animal populations here are carefully monitored for their health and progress. Originally 15 numbats were purchased from the Western Australian Government and released into Yukamara. Eight years later, and there were over 170. As the population has grown, numbats have been sent to other sanctuaries and some swapped to protect their genetic diversity. Fifteen numbats were relocated to Scotia Sanctuary in New South Wales. This 65 square kilometre property of semi-arid desert is said to be the largest conservation project in the world. Another resident of Scotia is the bridled nowtail wallaby. It was thought to be extinct until a small colony was found in Queensland. A few were brought to Scotia and have been bred successfully. These large sanctuaries enable animals to establish a home range suitable to their needs, unencumbered by the fence that protects them. As darkness descends on this ancient forest, a transformation takes place. Most of Australia's mammals are nocturnal. Betongs are the smallest and rarest of our kangaroos. As they dig for tubers and fungi, leaf litter is worked back into the soil as a natural compost. 
The reduction in numbers has partly caused a build-up of forest understories across Australia. This creates dangerous fuel for bushfires. Unlike some European rats, Australian rodents like the stick nest rat are not disease carriers as they prefer to feed on vegetation. The stick nest rat is a very endangered mammal, a placental mammal. There'd be about two and a half thousand left I think in total and they're mainly on offshore islands off the coast of South Australia, but there are no wild mainland populations. Oh, you're going to play coy, are you? Come Now what we're going to be doing uh, is inspecting the stick nest rats mainly for cataracts in their eyes. Um, they seem to have a, a problem with um, getting cataracts and going very blind and we just want to check our population to make sure that none of them are blind and see what stage they're at where there's any work has to be done on fixing up their cataracts. Yeah, what we're planning on doing is um, introducing the stick nest rats from captivity into the bush which is why we want to make sure we have healthy animals. And then what we, we can't just trap them because they're so small, but we will be radio collaring the ones that we release. Um, so we're in the process of doing that at the moment. The bilby is another endangered mammal that was once widespread in semi-arid regions of Australia. It makes its home in logs or burrows and spends the night in search of fungi, tubers and bulbs. This is uh, just the captive bilby food and putting a bit of water with it to keep away the ants. And the only reason that I'm feeding bilbies, or we have bilbies in captivity, is so we can feed them this food and keep them at a breeding weight all year round. And um, they can breed all year round that um, and produce hopefully twins every three and a half, four months or so. Come on then, nice healthy looking sucker. Yoo-hoo! Full of beans. The animals at Yukamara are often checked for their health. 69 EBT. Population numbers are carefully monitored to protect genetic okay. diversity and prevent I'll overcrowding. I'll have a look, she doesn't want me in there, she's pulling it really, really tight. Look, two! Two bubbles. Just see what sort of temperament it's got. These bilbies are to be reintroduced to another sanctuary yeah, called Warrawong. <laughs> bilbies have been locally extinct here for over 70 years, so it is a very special event for these supporters and volunteers. The bilbies are joining other animals at Warrawong that can only exist within this protected area. These sanctuaries demonstrate that a properly managed feral free area will allow Australian mammals to thrive once again. To achieve this, sufficient land must be acquired. Feral proof fences are erected. Feral animals are eradicated and wildlife that once lived there is reintroduced. The land within these sanctuaries is rejuvenated and maintained. The loss of biodiversity is reversed. It is this process and the results that continually draw tourists from around the world. Yukamara Sanctuary contains one of the largest remaining stands of old growth Mallee. Mallee is extremely slow growing, taking one year to grow one millimetre in diameter. The base of the tree swells to store nutrients. 
This is called lignotuber. As old shoots are destroyed, new ones are developed, causing the base to spread. After hundreds of years, it becomes hard to tell where one tree stops and another begins. These trees are difficult to age as the core and growth rings are eaten and rotted away. A Mallee tree near Perth is said to be the oldest gum in Australia, estimated at 6,300 years old. Right here we've got a 50 year old Mallee. It's a Eucalyptus gracilis, which some people might know as a Yorl or a White Mallee. Now we know this one's about 50 years old, one by the width of its trunk. These trees are averaged at growing at about a millimetre a year. This one here is about 50 mil across, so there you've got 50 years. But on top of that, we actually have photographic evidence as well of the era when these trees were cut down. And that's pretty good proof as well of the fact that we've got these trees at about that age. Now, if that's 50 years of growth, that'll help give you an idea when we go over a little bit further and we get ourselves an old growth white mallee tree, which is about 650 to 700 years old of trunks on it. And so here we've got one of the old growth mallees that I was talking about. And this is the same species as the white mallee I showed you before, the yorl. And the entire inside of this thing is hollowed out. And this is ideal habitat for the sort of species we harbour out here, in particular an animal like the numbat, which isn't just using these hollows, but it's feeding on the termites which created those hollows as well. These trunks are six or seven hundred years old, but the space and where I'm standing would have been a tuber once before as well. So the entire tree and its mass would be closer to 1500 years old to be this size. The word mallee derived from the Aboriginals, who used it to describe the water mallee whose roots contained valuable drinking water. Europeans applied the term to the many multi-stemmed species of eucalyptus. Mallee is unique to Australia. Botanist and environmentalist Professor David Bellamy visited Yukamara in 1999. For a pom to have to describe the flora and fauna of Australia is a bit ridiculous. We only have about 2,000 species of plant in the whole. We got two, yeah, in the whole of Britain. We've got more than that in this area of Mallee that I'm standing in. Um, it's very, very different, um, and it's a real toughie. I mean, that's why you lot are so damn good at contact sports. It's because you've got a contact floor out here. You've been in contact with a really strange and nasty environment, droughts, and then down comes the rain. And it's learnt to overcome those things. And it's also, I think, taught human beings a lot of things, that nothing can actually live here for all that long and reign supreme. Because if they do, something's going to come along and knock that off its pet. See, they, we get too clever. It's like investing money in the wrong thing. You invest it in a company and then that company, well, somebody supersedes it, so you basically lose all your money. So what we've got, we've got the original investors in the world. We've got plants and animals who, you know, have come to terms with the environment and hacked it to be sustainable. I mean, here we are in a bit of the oldest Mali uh, woodland left. And, you know, before anyone came here, that was totally sustainable. It got on with itself. The animals and plants had learned over a thousand years. They hadn't got it all right. I mean, a drought came along and things died, but other things took over. And uh, what we haven't realised yet, if you put a road to a thing like that, then you have downstream effects and it costs you money. Evidence suggests that many native species were gone from Mallee habitats within the first few decades of settlement which began in the 1840s. The earliest white explorers and settlers described the Mallee as a monotonous sea of scrub. Their methods of land use on fertile European soil proved unsuccessful here in the most nutrient depleted soils on earth. Since settlement, over 99% of the Mallee has been burnt as fuel or cleared for stock and agriculture. The issues associated with land clearing are not simplistic and go beyond the devastating loss of plant and animal life. 
there is a much more serious threat of land and water salinisation. This tree has been named the chain tree by staff at the sanctuary. It is estimated to be over 1500 years old. It still bears the scars inflicted by the axe in the 1800s and the chain in the 1900s. Two dozers with a massive chain between them were used to clear this area in 1950. Trees thousands of years old were pulled over, deep-rooted bushes and grasses were scraped away, mosses and lichens on the ground were destroyed, leaving the thin soil exposed. The chain tree though would not be moved. Its roots had taken over a thousand years to work their way down to the water table through cracks in the limestone. As the chain tightened, it cut into its trunk. The tracks of the dozers dug through the thin topsoil and found traction in the rock below. Then the chain snapped. The tree survived. Yukamara Sanctuary has erected this one hectare enclosure to breed and protect Malifal chicks from feral and native predators. In the wild, foxes eat a large number of eggs. The female Malifal can lay up to 30 eggs in one clutch. This enclosure will have a fast and positive effect on the Malifal's endangered status. Well, I'm not it. The male Malifowl builds one of the biggest nests of any bird in the world. A nest of fermenting and decaying vegetable matter is constructed in time for the female to lay her eggs. Mallee fowls spend most of their time on the ground, eating seeds, herbs and some insects. It is planned that over time other animals will be reintroduced into Yukamara. The ancient Mallee habitat will be saved and its surviving inhabitants will live on as they have for millions of years.